you followed a knowing. You heard a podcast and you booked a flight and you flew halfway across the world to go on a retreat with a largely unknown dude who runs tracking retreats. And watch what that is given. When we follow the non-rational part of us that knows, it moves us forward in ways we couldn't possibly conceive of. When the family advisors gathered, well, listen, first things first, you guys have got to get rid of that wild place out there in the middle of nowhere. Hunting lions is a bad idea on the best of days. There's nothing happening there. You've got to sell it. And my father, who was 15 years old at the time, stood up. No, we're, we're going to keep it. And that's how my family got into the safari business. Get ready to experience what the land has for you. Being in that landscape, it just felt like you kind of remembered it. A lot of the anxiety and depression that we feel, the sense of like meaninglessness, some of that is just an undiagnosed homesickness for a sense of being attuned to a wild place. Animals don't participate in the should and see that. But it was so beautiful because it showed me that there's this other part of me that is, is really undiscovered in some ways. And it felt really good to just be there and not have to prove myself. Mm. I mean, so much of the work that I've done in the healing space is some way just helping people get off all the layers of what they thought they should be, mm. who they thought they should be, just removing that patterning to get to the place that was already there. The journey that we're seeing now is so many men trying to shed the patterning of how we were forced to harden ourselves and condition ourselves to not feel. But out there amongst the trackers, sensitivity was at the foundation of mm. everything we did. Mm -hmm. There's something really sacred about wilderness mm -hmm. because where else can you go and get this kind of mirror to look at yourself through? Like you just don't. In being in the wilderness, I can't say how, but I feel like I know myself. Oh, I know a part of myself that I can't just get to mm. lying on the couch somewhere. I know my alertness. I know an intensity in me. And it's cool for us, you know, you think we started as lion hunters. But we really want the space to be a place that catalyzes healing and transformation in people. How we're creating connection, how we're approaching the natural world and all of that put together starts to put you into a different state of being. And Londlozi does that. Londlozi is an incredibly healing, transformative place. It's by design and it's by magic. Today we have on the Londo crew. We didn't really, we didn't come up with a name the, when Peyton and Lindsay and Maureen went there with the honey badgers. I know we were contemplating something to do with some hippo medicine, but mm. we never landed on anything. So we're just the guys who went to Londo with Boyd. Uh, and so for everyone listening, we have Boyd Vardy, hey, world, <laughs> world renowned <laughs> lion tracker, Chase Reeves, Hi. YouTuber. Yes. <laughs> That's all you are. You're just a YouTuber. Just a YouTuber. That's your only mask. That guy. That guy. And Greg, trader here in Austin. Financial trader. Financial, Not yeah. just like a pirate. Former professional basketball player. Yes. And now uh, stock boy for the House of Shan. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Many, if, many talents with House of Shan. If it feels I'll appropriate. Stock boy. So Greg, you did play professional basketball, hey? A long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. But yes. O hola. <laughs> so anyway, we were on today to, uh, we got back a little over a week ago from our trip to South Africa, where we, we spent four nights at Londolozi and uh, we visited Cape Town as well. And so just kind of wanted to share our experience. And um, a lot of people have been asking about Londolozi. Boyd's been on uh, the podcast three times. Three times. This is number four. And um, we've actually never gotten too deep into uh, Londolozi and certainly haven't spoke about your, uh, you actually lion tracking. This is a great story that, that Boy's going to share today about his uh, recent experience where we were there in that, uh, yeah, with that lion tracker hat on. So we're excited to share that. But I'd love for us to just to start out, Boyd, if you could give a little bit of the history of, of Londa Lozi so that we can kind of drop everybody into what that, you know, kind of that space is. Sure, absolutely. So the story of Londa Lozi begins like many great stories with the intake of large quantities of gin. 
And it kicks off in 1926 when my great grandfather was at a tennis party in Johannesburg in South Africa. And at the party, he heard about some bankrupt cattle farms that lay adjacent to the Kruger National Park. And in that moment, sight unseen, he decided that he would buy one of these places. So they literally went down to the deeds office and for no money, they bought one of these bankrupt cattle ranches. And the main reason that they bought it is the ranches were bankrupt for two reasons. One, it was very difficult to run cattle there because it's a low rainfall area. But secondly, because lions were eating all of the cattle. And so great investment. Um, Sounds like something I would do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely something you wouldn't invest in if someone offered you like an investor proposal. But he was an avid hunter and he was an adventurer. And so in the June of 1926, with a friend of his, they went to Londolosi for the first time. And getting there was a huge undertaking. There was a train that ran through the southern part of the property and they bribed the train driver to stop. And they got off and there must have been this amazing moment as the train pulled away. And they were standing there in the wilderness um, with an old map and a compass. And they literally just walked north on that compass bearing. And the idea was that is that eventually they would hit the river. And after, you know, a full day and maybe a day and a half of walking, they eventually did hit the river and they arrived under this beautiful dark ebony tree that still stands there to this day. And they slept the first night there. And with that initial trip, they began to set up the rhythms that we still operate in today. You would wake up before dawn, you would listen for if there were lions roaring, and then you would go and try and hunt them. And so really, that's how my great grandfather interfaced with the property. That's how my grandfather grew up hunting lions on the property. And that's how my father and uncle grew up. And then in 1969, and I should say too, that the property itself was, there were animals there but you didn't really get to see them. Most of the property was eye high scrub as a result of being overgrazed by the cattle. And there was game there, but it was pretty difficult to find. Um, and then in 69, my grandfather died. And in the wake of that loss, the sort of the family advisors gathered and they said, uh, well, listen, first things first, you guys have got to get rid of that wild place out there in the middle of nowhere. Hunting lions is a bad idea on the best of days. There's nothing happening there. You've got to sell it. And my father, who was 15 years old at the time, stood up and in one of those incredible moments of, uh, of youthful arrogance and brilliance, he said to the family advisors, no, we're, we're going to keep it. And they said, well, how do you intend to take care of your widowed mother now? And they said, well, we'll make it pay. And that's how my family got into the safari business. And the, the early operations, my father... 15, my uncle 17, soon my mother uh, joined the mix. She was also about 15. And they started getting this safari operation going. And it was generally just a big old shit show. They had these three mud huts by then. Um, they, as the staff, all lived in the huts until the guests came down. Then they would move out and go live in a trailer. I'm told that when it rained, people would go outside for shelter. <laughs> <laughs> and but really they built the whole business just out of you know chutzpah and a passion for the place people would come there they would take them tracking occasionally a lion would growl at someone as it ran off and they they, they were going to take the whole safari industry they had uh canoeing safaris um luxury safaris canoeing safari the first one they hit a hippo and they canceled canoe safaris <laughs> <laughs> luxury safaris meant they cooked you impala that they hunted off the land Rough safaris meant you brought your own food. So it was a real make it up as you went along. And, and that's really how they operated. And, but even though it was incredibly ragtag, word got out that there was this place you could go where you would run into these incredibly enthusiastic young people who would have a good time with you in the bush. You probably wouldn't see any animals, but it was fun. Um, and, then, and then they had a, a really big defining moment. And that was the arrival of a man by the name of Ken Tinley. And Tinley was a brilliant ecologist. He was a high school dropout who had been put into a biological sciences degree because he drew a picture of a, a moth with such intricate detail that the dean of the faculty put him in. Uh, he completed his studies and then he went and lived alone for a year in a reserve in Mozambique called Gorongosa. And during that year that he spent there in total solitude in nature, something very profound happened inside of Tinley, a, a kind of relationship with the natural world. It was as if he could feel the energy of the land and he could see how the moisture moved through the land and how that informed the flora and how that brought animals. And so when he rolled up 
at, around the fire at Londolozi and he met these young kids who were trying to start, start a safari business. He said to them, if you want this place to work, you need to partner with the land. You need to think of the animals as your kin. And you need to make sure that local people participate uh, in the economy and the protection of these areas. And so that was the first seed that was the sort of the kernel of the model that would become Londolozi. And they said to him, a partner with the land, what do you mean? And he said, come, I'll show you. And he took them out onto these clearings where there was just eye high scrub. And then he would walk them to the low point of the clearing and he would show them where there was a deep erosive furrow. And what was happening was that as the rain would fall, because the cattle had overgrazed the land, the moisture would all run off in these, in any road and you would lose all of that moisture. And he showed them how you clear the scrub and you go pack it in where you're losing the moisture. And that starts to establish the grasslands. And so that was, that was a, a hugely enlightening idea for them. And they started working on the land. They started clearing these clearings and started changing the moisture content of the soil. And as that started to happen, suddenly animals started to appear again. One day you would come out and there'd be a herd of zebra and then water bucks started to return. And so there was this real sense that they were starting to work with nature. And a number of years into that journey, bear in mind, it's apartheid South Africa. Um, a number of years into that journey, they had their first sort of mystical encounter almost. And my father and uncle were driving home. They'd been working on the land together. And as they drove home in the late evening light, a leopard stepped out onto the road in front of them and she stopped and she turned and she looked at them. And that was the first time a leopard had allowed herself to be seen. Prior to that, it was just leopards trying to get out of there. And she stopped and she turned and she looked at them and she growled and she had this one little broken canine. They drove back to the camp and they stopped the vehicle. And my uncle, who's a, he's kind of a enigmatic maverick type guy. He said, uh, whatever just happened, whatever that was, that's my future. That's what I'll be doing. And so he teamed up with Renius, who we spent times with brother, Almon. And for the next 12 years, they went out every single day and they just tracked that leopard. And over the course of that 12 years, they started to establish a relationship with her. She started to know that they meant her no harm. And at first they would see her from 100 yards and then 50 yards. And then eventually it got to the point where they could drive a Land Rover in next to her. And one day they were sitting there watching her and a cub came out and started to nibble on her ears. And we called that leopard the mother leopard for two reasons. The one was that uh, she had, I think in the end, nine litters of cubs. And all of those cubs grew up modeling their mother's trust of the safari vehicles. And the second reason was that really she was the mother of Londolozi and that she gave it life because word got out that there was a place in the middle of nowhere in apartheid South Africa where you could go and spend time with a wild leopard. And that idea just has tremendous allure. And you know now having been with those cats, the, the kind of the magic of that. And so people started to come. And as people started to come, the camp started to improve. Um, we were able to hire more local people who were able to start to participate in the project. And that was really the kind of the beginnings of it into what it is today. You know, and you just think about how many animals we saw and how many encounters we had. So it's a very long range. There's two things about it that are interesting to me. The one is like the scope of time. When you think about these restoration projects, like how long it takes. And the second is, and I guess that's what's most informed my work and how we met is, you know, like, how do we know when we know? Like, what, what in my great-grandfather made him buy that place? Uh, what made my father stand up and say, we're going to keep it and we're going to make it work? Because none of it is rational. You know, there's, on paper, it's all like, it doesn't make any sense. Um, and in that moment when my uncle saw that leopard, you know, what in him knew? And so that, that sort of, one, watching a wild place restore, and two, that idea that, Beyond our rational thought, there's something in us that knows. That's kind of been like the center of what has framed kind of my life and my journey. And, and yeah, for me, it was just incredible to be able to, you know, host you guys there and have friends come and, and share that place. That really feels like my kind of fi favorite thing to do. Yeah, especially a you know, bunch of guys who I happen to like, like you guys. Yeah, well, a, a couple of things come up for me. For one, I actually never put it together. Is that the, the Londo Lozi logo? Is that a representation of the mother? The, the logo, my sister actually designed the logo. And if you look at it closely, there's two parts to it. The one is it, um, it's the face of a leopard, but it's also a leopard orchid. So it's a flower. That, so it has that kind of symbolism of the leopard, but also of like the willingness of life, how life wants to grow. 
Um, and then it also looks a little bit like a butterfly, which is sort of the transformational power of the place. Mm, I love it. And by the way, for, for people listening, uh, Boyd's sister, Bronwyn, will be a future guest. Hopefully she's going to be coming to the States here later this year. And she's one of the most fascinating women you'll ever meet. So I'm excited for that. Mm. Um, people listening may have heard, caught you say that uh, early on, um, they hunted lions. Yeah. And so what was the, when was the transition? What, what happened to shift from hunting lions to tracking? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, it, you. Was, it was one of those things that, <laughs> <laughs> it was one of those things that they were, once they started, you know, getting going and in, initially they ran hunting safaris, but very soon as they built this model and started to work with nature, they realized the most sustainable thing they could do was be in partnership with nature. And, and it was like a shift in their psyche. Um, as they got involved in the conservation and the restoration, they started to realize that there was something that could be done here beyond the consciousness of hunting. And they started to realize that you could go out many, many times and see that lion, those, that leopard, that pride of lions. Um, you could photograph it hundreds of times as opposed to just going out once and hunting it. And they were changing, you know, as they did it, they were changing. They really moved and so many hunters become great conservationists because you have this connection with the natural world, but they were just changing and they realized as they built relationships with these animals that, you know, something had to be done differently. And so they moved, I see it as levels of consciousness. They moved out of the consciousness of hunting into this different way of being in relationship with nature. And, and I guess it speaks to that, that whole idea that, that the animals are your kin. The animals are, are, the, are our kin and they they really realized that all of the skills that they had developed as hunters, being attuned, tracking, had all translated incredibly well into showing people these wild animals. Mm -hmm. And so they had a very unique skill set. And in partnership with the Shangan trackers in that area, who are some of the best trackers in the world, suddenly people started to have amazing encounters with animals and the whole place started to get momentum. To that Shangan bit, like, uh, Rainius, who is in your book, Lion Tracker's Guide to Life, you tell the story of him being, you know, he got really good at tracking lions and animals because him and his younger brother would track, would track lions to try to steal some of their kill. Because that's like, dad wasn't going to bring us food. I, I mean, Renius is one of, one of the people on the planet who grew up hunting and gathering. He's connected to a way that we used to live in for thousands of years because that's literally how him and his family survived. They would go out, they would find the tracks of a lion or a leopard. They would follow that. If they found those lions with a kill, him and his brothers would get sticks and spears and they would run in screaming and they would try and flush the lions off the kill for a bit, cut a bit of meat. <laughs> I was once doing a talk at, uh, at some, some speaking gig that I had. And uh, it was, I think it might've even been Coca-Cola, but it, it was all of these um, restaurant chains. And I told that story. And one guy in the back said, now that's what I call takeaways. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Renius grew up inside of that. And so he's just uniquely attuned because he's just yeah. like, literally he's just lived in a totally different way. And you feel that when you're with him. I really connected with that because I've done a lot of crazy stuff growing up too. You know, like one time I tried to beat Tony Hawk pro skater Two like with every character. <laughs> so there was like this real connection that I yeah, had with Renius. Deep rela relatability. <laughs> connection to nature. But the Shangan, like tell us about like these there was people who lived in this landscape before long before it was like trying to be cattle ranchers long before like who are the indigenous to that area so the shangan people were a group that broke away from the zulu nation in fact shoshongan uh, was sent by uh, shaka zulu who was the, the zulu nation the zulu empire he was sent up to that area to go on a warring party when he got up there, he decided it was good land and he wasn't that into being at war. Mm. So he just settled <laughs> down and they became a breakaway group. And they lived between Mozambique and the eastern part of South Africa. And the Shangan people, they largely were nomadic initially, pastoralists. Um, but when you spend time with Shangan people, part of what makes them such incredible trackers is that they are storytellers. Deep inside of their DNA is storytelling and observing and watching and really a tracker is a storyteller. And, you know, when my family came to that area, we very quickly connected with Shangan families and we started to see that these guys' skill in the bush was just absolutely incredible. 
and they were fundamental. The presence of the, these world-class trackers was absolutely fundamental to the establishment of what Londolozi is now. And can you share a little bit about what that was like in apartheid uh, Af- South Africa, where you know your your family, a, a white family, was truly partnering with the you know the people in the area. I mean, were they getting a lot of pushback? What was what was the sentiment like in Johannesburg? Well, the initial the initial philosophy that my family had came from Tinley, who said that the protection of these wild areas. Tinley had an enlightened view, and he said the protection of these wild areas have to include um, the people who live here. It must be included in that process. And and he also said you must make wild places economically viable. And that was a big shift because prior to that, it was national parks, and national parks were state-funded, and it kept everyone out. And this model said, you know, include everyone who lives in these areas and also find a way to make it commercially viable. And that's where the safari business came. And, you know, now we think about ecotourism, we hear about it all over the world, but really it wasn't happening. Uh, and Londolozi, the idea was we wanted to build an inclusive model um, that was economically viable, that allowed the land to be protected. Um, so, so that was the initial philosophy. And then later, my family were connected through a white medicine man who lived in the area with a man by the name of Enos Mabuza. And Enos was, he was basically the, he was appointed by the apartheid government to be the head of a, what we called the homelands, which you guys would call reservations. But he was actually working for the ANC government, the African National Congress, to glean information on the, what the apartheid government was thinking. And when he met um, my father and my uncle initially, um, he started to see this enlightened model they were building. And he said to them, at Londolozi, you must be a place where you pour the cultures together and you must be an example of what South Africa could be. And that is what they, they latched onto that idea. They believed in that idea and they started to build that. Um, controversially in apartheid South Africa, you know, we, we lived with our name on a watch list by the special branch, which is basically the, the dangerous arm of the apartheid government. But it was that philosophy that we stuck to. And that is why when Nelson Mandela came out of prison, he came to Londolozi, brought by Enos Mabuza. And, and Man- Mabuza wanted to show him the model. And Mandela saw it and he immediately got it. This is what South Africa could be. A rainbow nation, all cultures living together in harmony, um, respecting and showcasing the incredible assets that we have in South Africa. Mm. So that was that's kind of the, the backstory on how that how that evolved. And then Mandela actually eventually said to us, take this model and go and export it all over Africa. And so we went from one operation to 30 operations and then back to being uh, family run and standalone again. So that was sort of our journey with it. Okay. So one of the times we're tracking lions in Londo and the lion goes off on another property. You guys are not the only safari lodge out there. How, like, you mentioned Kruger National Park. I I didn't know about Kruger National Park, but I was in a conversation with somebody here. They're like, I want to go to Kruger. Like, it's like people know about Kruger. Um, I don't know. What, what's Give me a little bit of the lay of the land in terms of, of uh, like some some other neighboring properties we can go on to and track mm-hmm. on and others we, we cannot. And others we, we will not name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We write songs about them because yeah. they're just terrible people. <laughs> so Kruger National Park, the the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier National Park, 10 million acres of wild land. So you look east from Londolozi, it's just this incredible wilderness um, that runs between Mozambique, a national park that is connected with a national park on the Mozambican side and the Zimbabwean side. Just this tr- tremendous wild land. And then Londolozi is uh, attached to that inside of a, res- a greater reserve called the Sabi Sand, and that is a bunch of privately owned reserves connected to the Kruger National Park, but it's private ownership. And inside of that private ownership, there's just relationships. So we have good relationships with some of our neighbors and we have other neighbors that we don't drive on. And that's really just handshake stuff. Like yeah. you, you can come onto my land, I can go onto your land. And it's it's really just in the spirit of the area and traversing. And so there's so much land that has this kind of reservation quality to it, this nature preserve kind of quality to it. and what immediately struck me as we get off the plane, I mean, as we're flying over and then we get off the plane and we're in a Land Rover, like driving, you know, an hour to Londolozi from the Skakuza airport. We're already on safari. Yeah. There's already so many animals 
And this is just, I'm, a, I'm imagining a function of there is so much land. And like lion, tri- lion prides will, will, will like mosey through these things over there. Oh, that, these, this pride is over here. They've lived on this land for a little while, but then they move to different. So it's just so oh. much land. I mean, you can wake up in the morning and you can drive down our bond boundary and find tracks of a pride of lions crossing in. Mm. And it could be a pride of lions that have come from the Kruger National Park that we've never seen before. Mm. But they've moved down through the park and then one day they show up, they might want to set up a territory. Elephants will move from the north of the park and then they will come and walk up the sand river that runs through the center of Londolozi. Mm. So it is, it's this amazing open system. Mm. And the result of that is, you know, you don't, it's not like we own the animals. Right. It's the animals are there. And they come and go and they move. And it's actually, um, it's pretty magical as a result of that. From the airport to the lodge was a game drive, like you said. But like, even our guide life was probably like, guys, you're going to see plenty of these animals. Yeah. Like elephant, zebra, warthogs. Like, it was so amazing just to like be in that situation, getting off the airplane. It's like, oh, cool. I'm in a Land Rover. I'm having a beer. And he keeps stopping and pointing out all these animals. And it's like, we got to continue to see all those animals throughout the week in so many different ways, shapes, and forms. And it was just like, what a way to drop in. Yeah. It's like, I mean, you've gone back like thousands of years. You get on the plane in Newark yeah. and you land in South Africa and you, you hop to the Eastern wild section and you get off the plane and you're just back in time mm. to a yeah. time where we lived, you know, amongst the wild animals. So that, it, I mean, that's, that's that, it. That hits your psyche. And it, it can't does. not affect your psyche. When you talk about it often, when you refer to going to Londolozi as the Londolozi time warp, and in that game drive, one hour, 60 minutes into landing, you're already, as you said, Greg, dropping into this different energy about, you know, kind of how we have existed. Yeah. I mean, the lo- I, I've, actually just started saying it to people like we're going to drop you into the londlozy time warp you've come all this way we've got four days here and it'll feel like five minutes and it'll feel like 10 years and some of that is just you're in you're in such a unique environment you're away from your screens your phones you're just you go into a different state of consciousness more presence and to me where there's more presence there's more life it's just there's like a density of experience and that 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 does something to the way you're experiencing the time to the, okay. So, so great grandpa buys this land and is like, I'm going to do some lion hunting today. (laughs) Like lion hunting was a thing. Like that's, that was the game. Like, like here in America, what's our, what's our big prey animal in North America? No, just take a moment. How old's uh, Aiden now? Aiden's 12. Okay. So just, let me just like tap you into lion hunting for a moment. Mm. So the way that my father grew up, is you know you go out and hunt a lion with he would go with his father and on one occasion um he he took a shot and he wounded a lion he went back to the camp he called his father and they decided you know if you wound an animal you've got to go and get it and and this is back in the consciousness of that time but it's kind of hard to get your head around when you go and try and get a wounded lion there's only two outcomes the lion dies or one of you dies, <laughs> you know, they're like, and I'm just, it's interesting that the, like, you can just imagine saying like, okay, Aiden, here we go today. Like, yeah. I hope, uh, I hope it's not us, mm. <laughs> you know? So lion hunting is a, it's a, it's, I don't know. It's just quite an undertaking. Yeah. 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 And it was not uncommon. It was, it was, I mean, a lot of my friends back in the old country, <laughs> they would have some sort of lion around, you know, and I always wanted one, but it always felt a bit, you know, odd to hunt this beautiful beast but it was not an unknown thing it was a common thing and in some ways less common to just be tracking and i'm curious because safari now i've realized there's like a whole ecosystem of safari lodges Mm -hmm. it's a very real thing like people from joburg or cape town grow up and go like i'm gonna go work on a safari lodge Mm -hmm. i'm gonna be a guide or a ranger or or staff in some way um there's a business there in the same way, like for me going, going to Lake Tahoe when I was growing up and you just see like the jet ski rentals and like all of this other stuff. But this is safari, mm-hmm. not hunting, mm-hmm. just tracking to see animals, mm-hmm. mostly 
mo- like it sounds like vast majority of people just stay on the Land Rover. Mm-hmm. Don't get off by foot. I mean, when you're talking about, we got our compasses and we set off in a due north direction towards the river. <laughs> you know? Yeah, the, the industry has evolved over the years. Uh. And for me, that's been a, as I said, I, I honestly have seen a transformation in consciousness. And I'm grateful that hunting brought us to the land, but it changed us. Now we still track. Um, we still use those skills, but it's to find and allow people an opportunity to be with wild animals. Yeah. And that's the, that's the change. And people who like young South Africans from diverse backgrounds work in the industry. And that was Londolozi's mission to make the protection of these wild areas commercially viable. Mm. Because if there's a business model there, the opportunity to protect the land is dramatically enhanced. So I'll just tell you, for example, the fact that you guys came out on a safari to visit um, we have 270 staff members uh, as a result of the land being restored and the presence of those animals. Each one of those staff members has about 10 dependents um, back at home that they are taking care of. So your decision to come and visit and, and experience it has a tremendous impact into the area. Mm. Think um, about it in terms of Rainius. Like you're talking about how dangerous lion hunting is. Like they used to go try and steal food from lions. Yeah. And then you have this guy who's made a complete career out of tracking lions, who's like a world-renowned speaker, who's also walking us through the bush. And this is one of my favorite parts of the whole trip, not even seeing animals, who's walking through with him. Yeah. And him showing us all the ways the Shangan used to, and probably still do in some ways, use the resources there to, to live. Like whether it's stripping bark off of a, branch to brush your teeth or my kids like this one the best uh. all the remedies that they use elephant dung for oh like yeah he literally right. you oh you have a headache all right so they'd take the dry elephant dung and then they would light it and then they would put a sheet over your head and you would breathe that in to like alleviate a headache wow or you would light it in your house to get the mosquitoes out mm. like these guys Talk about being one with the land, like they know that. And then having him there showing you not only how to track lions, but walking through the bush, getting out of the Land Rover and experiencing the land a little more like how they see it was really powerful. Yeah. I I thought that was one of my favorite parts. And that was like a 30 minute walk with him. And like you said, a storyteller, like that guy is insane. Oh yeah. He's magic. He is so incredible. And that's the beauty too, is to, to, and, and not everyone who goes there gets to have a, a, a rainous experience, you know, but to be in the presence of someone who's operating at such a high level of mastery. Again, if you can just get out of your own head and just be present with what's going on, it, it's amazing. Like, how is he fucking doing this? It's the same concept we talked about a lot. Don't go there and say, I want to see the big five. Tell your guides and your tracker, like, let's go, let's get out of the truck and like, show me what you do. Yeah, I'm up for anything. Yeah, like yeah. that's their favorite guests or the people that are like not trying to check the boxes. Yeah. And my, you know what? You might not see the lion. Like we almost didn't see a lion and it ended up happening. But like our trip wouldn't have been any less mm. had we not had that experience. No, and it, so much other stuff. And I want to be clear: just because you don't get Rainius doesn't mean you don't have a world class tracker. I and mean, we we had life as as our tracker and our ranger Nick that were. And when um, you're saying life, this is the name of a guy. It's not like we're just being mystical about life is our tracker. Exactly, <laughs> it's a guy named Life. Thanks who, for clearing that up. Yeah, That's right. The point though, like, give those guys a chance to show you what the land has to offer. Hell yeah! Not just driving around in the truck. Though. Yeah, you know, like it's like I'm gonna go sit with Chase and show him how to do a YouTube video. No, yeah. like Chase, walk me through the steps here. I'm 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 open. I'm a student here. I want to learn. Yeah, and that's just such the biggest the biggest thing is this perspective. If I could give anybody tips and tricks out there, and this came from directly from you, actually, I was like, what, what would your advice be to to people who are coming on the safari? And it really is this perspective: is come. Get ready to experience what the land has for you. Mm-hmm. There is something dramatic uh, and visceral, at least to me, and I think to all of us, about being in that landscape. It just felt 
I put it like it just felt like a, like you kind of remembered it mm-hmm. in, in a lot of it was this nervous system sort of like, dude, this is where you're from. You know, this is like this is not yeah. manufactured. Uh, I mean, one of my things for a long time now has been that a lot of the anxiety and depression that we feel, the sense of like meaninglessness, some of that is just an undiagnosed homesickness. Mm for a sense of being attuned to a wild place mm. because some you don't have to work that hard to find your meaning and purpose because every day yes. you're having encounters you're putting your attention on life on living things yeah. you're attuned you're using your skills you it's i don't know it's, there's a relational quality to being in the natural world that infuses every day and every encounter with meaning and even when you just you land and you go out on that vehicle you're like we're going to attune ourselves. We're going to see what happens today. We're going to open ourselves to, to this environment and we're going to learn. And so it just starts happening. You don't have to work too hard at it. Yeah. I'll tell you, the biggest thing for me was, was this, uh, you mentioned the animals being our kin. Mm-hmm. And it was this, uh, when you're out in that space, you're seeing families, you're seeing a whole ecosystem of animals that all like feed on each other and communicate with each other and pass each other in the night and like, Hey, you're not going to get me. Okay, cool. And like, like, like animals that don't eat each other all running together from animals that do eat us, but you're just one species amidst many. Yeah. And my, you know, my Monday through Friday is, is like, you're listening to the podcast. You're getting fired up. You're like, who am I going to be? Like, where am I heading? Where's my gratitude, my affirmation, setting my course, figuring out what I'm going to do, working on it, executing, heading in this direction so different from like, okay, we're just out here. And I get it that we're on safari, we're tracking, it's a vacation, but we're, we're, we're tracking. We've got ourselves this, I don't know, this exercise to track. And because of that, we're, we're attuning ourselves. Like you say, I found that tracking was like putting together a puzzle. You know, when you get really immersed in putting together a puzzle, something like like that. Tracking's a lot like, and if you think, yeah, if you think about it, it seems can be like a lot like life. It can be. Where you're going. You can it use does. All these lessons, even though it's a vacation. Yeah. In your normal life. You should write a book and about this, Boyd. Boy, this is like some good book material. But just that sense of like we're one amongst many species. It contextualized the whole human project. Well, yeah. My take on that is that when you observe the natural world, and you and you're immersed in it like that you start to see there's an incredible intelligence to it Mm. and not just evolutionary intelligence, but everything is operating somehow relationally with everything else. And each animal has a unique nature and moves in a certain way and knows where to be and how to, and how to be itself. And it's just so smart the way the grasslands inform certain flowers and how that draws in certain animals and trees fruit. And that's how they dispert themselves. And you just see this intelligence. And then if you watch it enough, you realize I am a part of the same intelligence yeah. in some fundamental way. Absolutely. I am a yeah. part of the same intelligence. We, we are a part of the same intelligence. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's just becomes unmissable mm-hmm. at a certain point. You look at those, like we would say a couple of times, like those Impala, like they're prey or they don't think of that. Like they don't, they're not prey. They're just Impalas and they, they're, that's how they live. Yeah. We're looking at them like, dude, you guys are like sitting targets. Mm -hmm. But it's like, no, that's just. This is their whole way of life. They have a way, you know, they're fast and they can get away if they have to. Sometimes they're going to get killed. Mm -hmm. But like we put this on them Mm -hmm. from, I don't know, looking at animals in zoos or reading books. But like when you're out there, like you said, you kind of just realize these animals are all just doing what they're supposed to. And yeah. they're doing it with, yeah. in the most amazing way. You know, they just do what they're doing. You look at a pride of lions. When they're resting, they're resting. Just the deepest rest. And then, like, the temperature starts to change, and they get up, and they start hunting. And when they're hunting, they're hunting. And they're never lying there thinking, like, ugh. Agnes messed up that kill yesterday or, you know, st- why is it that Steve breaks cover early? Like there, there, there's no, mi- when, what I mean is there's no mind of past or future. It's just presence in what they're doing. And I believe that actually starts to entrain you in some fundamental way. Mm. But what, what I'm interested in, and I wanted to ask you guys, like if you could, if you think of like one moment each that had a profound impact on you, I would love to hear like what really, if you now having had a few, what have we had like a week or two to integrate, like, out of the trip, what was something that really changed you, moved you, affected you? 
I mean, I just love looking at that environment through other people's eyes. And yeah. every time people come and like we get to be together there, I learn about the way the environment affects people through their experiences. So it's, I'm just interested. Well, the first thing that comes to mind for me is, is that I was, um, that I was ill with something. <laughs> and so it's not really, uh, apropos to the, the question. So I may hand it over to, to one of you guys. So but I can... to that point, I mean, it's a good, it's a good spot for, for like, that was a big part of this trip for you in an important way. It was both like your highlight and your low light in some ways. Yeah. It was, um, just for, for, for those who aren't, aren't privy to this. When I landed in South Africa, evidently I was sick with something. I don't know if it was one of these variants or whatever, but my entire time at Londolozi, I was, you know, every time I would go to sleep, I would wake up in a pool of sweat mm. and I would wake up and be somewhat fine. Thankfully, I had my feel free with me to help <laughs> kind of boost my energy. But what I found was, is when we were all together and when Bronwyn and Rich would be there and even your parents, like I wasn't, uh, I didn't have a lot to offer in the way that I maybe normally would. I wasn't sharing a lot. I wasn't very conversational, wasn't very social. And it was, there was a lot of tension for me because here I am, like I've spent some time with, with Rich and Bronwyn before. I haven't met your folks yet and I've been dying to, and, and I wasn't able to um, connect in a way that I had in the past. And for me, you know, as you said, Chase, this is very much a, a ceremony for me in, in understanding that. Um, and, and, it, and it came to me in Cape Town mm -hmm. right before we had our meditation was. You know, there's a part of me, this quiet presence um, that I maybe haven't tapped into nearly as much as as um, the opportunities that have presented themselves. And so, so it was really sitting with that tension mm -hmm. and being okay with not sharing stuff that I know and being super interesting, whatever the different yeah, ways it's like, are. It's okay for you to not be on. Mm -hmm. To not be on. Or yeah. who you think you're supposed to be versus who you really are right now. Like yeah. You were, you were just had to like kind of stomach that and, and you'd had to watch it too. Cause you just had to sit there going like, I wish I could engage more and I really can't. And then you got to be more of an observer of, of lots of situations. And when you're an observer, wow, you pick up a lot. And by the way, I was so grateful for that. You were sitting at the table because boy, you were carrying a lot of conversation for me. <laughs> I mean, and I mean that. <laughs> you <laughs> shut the fuck up. But I am a YouTuber. Real, we were, I was sitting there. I was like, I'm so glad you're sitting here uh. with me, Rich and Braun, because I got nothing mm. right mm. now. Um, and so that was, was a, kind of a, a great experience for me. And you, you know, I mean, we joked about it. You're like, dude, you have it. And I'm like, I don't have it. I'm fine. And it was this, this idea that I don't get sick. I take care of myself and you know, wh whatever the story was, I was telling myself and it wasn't until your sister, it really gave me permission to have yeah. it mm -hmm. and said, you have it. It's okay. But like that was like important for you really important and it's like why did i need permission uh, what was it for me and i'm still you know kind of integrating that but it's it was for me that was as you mentioned chase we had we had talked about this at some point in the trip the highlight and the low light and it was it was both for me because it sucked feeling physically the way i did and mm. then dealing with the tension of not being cal mm. um but it was so beautiful because it showed me that there's this other, you know, this other part of me that is, is really undiscovered in some ways. Mm -hmm. And it felt really good to just be there and not have to prove myself. Mm -hmm. I sense that like quiet presence in you sort of, I, I don't know what Cal on versus, I mean, I see Cal in like groups of parties and this, that, and the other, but you, you've always been somebody who has, there's some, there's more behind the scenes than meets the eye. And I think that that you kind of you carry a presence with you there. So it was somewhat surprising for me to hear how much of a new exploration that was for you, because you, you from my perspective, you kind of carry that you, you carry that perspective. Well, whether we're just here in the lair or out and about. So, you know, good work. Yeah, No, thank you. I'm glad that you, I'm glad you, you you I mean, I don't know. It was it just seemed like that was an important part. And, and that was sort of surprising to me. And so fundamental to what the animals were teaching us too. Like I, all of them 
are just in their being. None of them are wrestling with, hey, you know, if I'm not showing up in a certain way, am I still allowed to be here? Am I, what are people going to mm. think of me? This is none of that socialization. It's just there. Mm. And so it's almost like, you know, whatever the ceremony gods had in store, it was like, just be like an animal. You just are where you are. Mm. Yeah. Super perfect. I think uh, our friend Noah, line from your book, animals don't participate in a should. Yes. Mm. And that's like, that was, you can see that. Like, yeah. and to me, like that was, yeah. And you know, it. it's such a good way of saying it. Like, I, can I just be here? And what is happening is I'm low energy and I've got nothing to give. That's just where I am. I, sh now you start to get into, I should yeah. be, you know, now, you, now that's where the suffering starts. I've come all this yeah. way and now I'm not yeah. going to, this is what should be happening. It's a big yeah. flight, man. Yeah. It's a big flight. And I'm always thinking when I'm flying like that, it's, it's like, I'm going to be dead i'm gonna be a, like driftwood for a little while you know yeah and uh no or, matter, or no gonna... matter how many suppositories i take <laughs> to boost my nad levels <laughs> thank god i had those i woke up Dude, in a I pool of sweat and some other stuff <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was dripping i was dripping a little methylene blue from some orifices for sure <laughs> what about you greggy boy what where, where do you land uh powerful perspective back to boyd's question like you kind of mentioned it with how your uncle had seen the, the leopard mm -hmm. and how it was like, and you mentioned it in a few times, like a leopard only is going to be seen if it wants to be seen. Yeah. Mm. And like on our first drive, we drove into that dry Creek bed and like found this mother leopard with her cub mm. and like watching them interact. And like, I wrote about it as in my journal, sending it back to my parents. Like it was just like how you would interact with, your mm. kids like the, mm. the cub was kind of fucking with the mom every once in a while and sometimes she would entertain it and other times she'd be like get the hell away from me and mm. but realizing like that those leopards walked five feet from us mm. like i almost could have yeah. reached out and touched the leopard oh yeah and having it been like all right we had done an hour game drive from the airport and i saw these animals and like i have been wanting to go to south africa forever so like seeing that in person was amazing. Having that encounter with the leopard right away, basically my friend Scott, who's been on, I don't know how many times he's been to Africa. He was like, dude, you don't understand how rare mm. that is. People go on safari their whole lives and don't have that experience. Uh -huh. So like seeing and hearing you say like that was part of like what drew Londolozzi into kind of what it is and then having that experience mm. was very powerful. And then also, for what we were talking about, we would, you know, you're like, all right, we're going to start the day with, uh, see where those rhinos bedded down last night. <laughs> we're going to go find where they bedded down, then we're going to just track them. Mm. And we'll see what happens. Yeah. And we did that a couple times. And it was never like, oh, we're going to go track rhinos again. It was like, because when you track the rhino the one time, I think we had that really powerful uh, elephant counter mm. and what got me similar to what we're talking about is like we're walking through this bush i think people a lot of people go on fire and they're probably like i'm not getting out of the car yeah these animals are gonna kill me i was never scared mm -hmm. and granted i'm with you and other people and there's a rifle but like even <laughs> nick said the rifle is just for liability mm. like it's not really gonna save us and having these experiences where like we're tracking a rhino and then at one point like it smelled us and it started moving and like I was, you know, alert, but I was never scared. And like when we had the elephant encounter where we're trying to check around all of a sudden to our right, 20 yards away, a huge bull elephants there and our guide can't whistle to get your attention. Cause his lips are too chapped. Cause his lips are too chapped. <laughs> and we're sitting there and you guys are, you know, Hey guys, back up, get behind that tree, show submission. And it walks and it looks straight at us, literally like staring at us. And it, it realized that we were not a threat and we were respecting its space and respecting like the ways of, you know, the bush. And it was awesome because you can have those encounters and it could have been with a lion, it could have been a leopard. I wasn't scared. I think that was powerful for yeah. me to be on foot in these spaces where you'd usually be like, oh my gosh, we're prey. These, these animals are going to come get us. They're not going to come get you. 
Now, if you're an idiot and you run towards the elephant or reach your hand out at the leopard or don't respect the situation, it could go bad. But if you're respectful and you like honor that space, it's all good. And like that was super powerful. That would that that was actually the the tracking the rhinos um, in that experience, and we kind of joked about it um, afterwards because you know when you think about it, <laughs> it's a lot like life. But but really, we're our 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 aim was to track the the rhino in within that experience because we were present with it. We had this incredible encounter, and for me, it was probably the most powerful encounter we had during the whole trip of this this bull elephant 20 meters from us and just in it we were all in the field together and we backed up gave it space but just you know again we we were we were paying attention to what was happening all around us and 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 bear in mind we were tracking rhinos we didn't find them but the fact that we had been willing to set off on their track, not knowing whether we're going to find them or not, being willing to follow the clues that were given to us, that put us in the zone to have that encounter with that elephant and be on foot with an energy that big. And the fact that he was a little bit above us, so we were also looking up at him, just that profile and the feeling in the air. Um, And then, of course, we, we actually never found the rhino, except we got onto a clearing and then they popped out where we were like sitting, having a drink later. So, Yeah, I mean, I think that's a big said, thing. It's like the willingness to go and follow opens us to opportunities. And and if you think about it, it's, it's tracking it, yeah. is a lot like life. It's a lot <laughs> like well, life. Like 15 minutes after that, right? We went, we did our like nightly like sunset, have a beer, have some snacks. And the rhinos literally that we couldn't find walked past 30 yards from us. Mm. And basically Boyd goes, that's how you track a rhino, boys. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was once running a retreat and I was saying to people, you know, and it was one of these retreats using tracking to find your purpose. I was saying, guys, we don't find rhinos just sitting around in the track, uh, in the camp here. You've got to go out. You've got to start tuning in. You've got to start looking. It's just like your life. You can't just sit there and say, I wonder what the next thing is or just I'm waiting for the next thing and then I'll do it. You've got to start trying things. Put yourself in the zone. And a woman looked at me. She said, there's a rhino behind you. <laughs> and like in the middle of my speech, a rhino had walked out on the clearing on the far side of the river. I was like, manifestation. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes it just works. Yeah, for me, uh, there is, there's definitely some bits about learn. We're, we're, tracking a, we're tracking a rhino and we find out it's actually a, uh, a over time, Rainius and you come to the conclusion that actually this is a male rhino. We don't want to track a male rhino because they put on massive miles. They'll just go and wander for days and days and days um, and then come back when come back to the crew. They'll just put on too many miles. We'll never catch up with them. Um, that just and, and how did we learn that? Well, there was this big pile of dung and then these scuff marks. And Rainius is like, this is what the males do when they when they when they have a poo, they scuff up the ground right here. That's how we know this is a male line or male rhino. And we don't want to track the male because it goes too far. We're going to find the group of the moms and the, and the children. Right. So just that as an, as one of these many examples, uh, you know, elephants being matriarchal, right? If you like one of the only, one of the real dangerous things with elephants is if you get between, uh, the, what was it called? A calf was a baby. Yes. It's called a calf elephant and, and the matriarch, right? because they're a matriarchal critter species. Um, Learning about the different, the different ways of being these different species, like they all have their different ways and I couldn't help but like bring it back to our species and like, what are we like? Oh, we're like, and, and I'm from, you know, I was raised by MTV, right? So it's just like this like hookup culture, got into, Christianity, like the the world of evangelicalism, like there's all these norms. Mm-hmm. There's all this cultural and, uh, and patterned structure on top yes. of your beingness, your yes. essence, or you know. So getting into the into visceral real life experience with these 
species who have a way of being that is just as patterned as mine, mm-hmm. but it's kind of, they're not reading the books about it. They're not being influenced by influencers on TikTok about it, right? Well, I mean, I think about that a lot. And, you know, even in Buddhism, they refer to it as true nature. Mm. Your, the goal of your sitting meditation is to establish your true nature. Yeah. And, you know, how does a lion know that it is a pride animal and it likes to hunt in the open savanna? And mm. how does a leopard know that it's a secretive animal? And from the minute they arrive, they are in tune with their way of being. Yeah. And... I mean, so much of the work that I've done in the healing space and the coaching space is some way just helping people get off all the layers of what they thought they should be, Mm. who they thought they should be, just removing that patterning to get to the place that was already there. Yeah. You know, just uh, the sense of belonging, a sense of knowing. Yes. uh, And a way of living, you just, uh, not all this conditioning about how I should be, but just uh, knowing what I need to do next. That's Coming what I mean about the, deep place. the way that it kind of contextualized my own humanity. Yeah. Because, again, that, that sense of I should this or, or I want that. Thank you, Cal. Like, the, I want to be, like, be more comparing myself. My father's hopes for me. What, what, yeah. All of this gets so recontextualized in this space. And to your point, Greg, about I wasn't scared. I think I, think I was scared. I, not not necessarily like consciously scared, not, not fully like, Oh no, what's going to happen. I was, I never felt any of that, but like the research on flow states uh, talks about how, when there are are consequences, when there are stakes, you, you get into like, maybe this is why a lot of people wait to just before the big test to, to start cramming or something Mm -hmm. like that. It's like, we need the stakes and the consequences for something to start to really get down to go time. But the, the, it was go time yeah. in there. You're, even though, I, like, again, my body felt safe, it did feel sitting behind a couple bushes from a rhino that we couldn't quite see, but we could see the movement. We could hear its breathing and its little sounds. And you definitely knew, like, whoa. I think that's, like, exactly what you're saying. Like, it was game on. Game like, on. Everything in you was attuned to where the hell is that rhino right yeah. now? And it, if it crashes through totally. there, what are we going to do? Yeah. And the fear factor involved adds to the experience because yeah. it's like, we've never had that experience. Absolutely. Before. I've never been in the wilderness with the chance for a rhino to crash through the trees. Mm. So like part of like, and I didn't think about it this way until you said that, but that's why it's so powerful. Yes. That's yeah. why there's this elephant that if we handled the situation differently, it could have been really dangerous. Mm. And the way, you know, what makes you safe in that environment? Your alertness, your attunement, how fresh are these tracks? Mm. You know, what, what, using your ears, using your eyes, being, having a sense of how the story's unfolding. What have we got here? We've got a mother and a calf and we've got a bull and the bull is following the mother and the calf. So he's going to be putting a bit of pressure on them. They might be wanting to get away from him. So their adrenaline might be a little bit up. You know, all of that is are the things that allow you to be safe well before the encounter. The sounds of oxpeckers calling. Okay, there's birds calling up there that sit on rhino. We might be getting close now. The wind direction. How do we position ourselves so that they're, they don't get a huge you know, gust of our scent? All of that is what makes it safe. You know, layer one, being almost ahead of the environment, attuned to it. Layer two, um, how do we react when we have the encounter? You know, and and all of that stuff is, it actually makes it very safe, but you got to get it right. And and the fact that you've got to get it right, everyone knows that. I mean, we spoke about it before. You know, if we see an animal, do not run. Um, look at us, and we'll we'll navigate to a safe position, or we might have to stand our ground on certain occasions. Um, so you know, that sort of stuff is important. On the flip side, so we're. T- I'm talking about this like I'm some pro tracker. You are now. You I are. Now. You are. I mean, you were pretty. You were it's like a there. it's like a CrossFit certification. One week and you're good. That's yeah, <laughs> good. I could do it by myself. But on the on the <laughs> flip side, someone like you who's done this your whole life, when you were tracking lions with life for one day, and we pretty much weren't allowed to go with you. A, we would have slowed you down, but it was thick and it was maybe a, a little more dangerous than what we were doing. You even said, like, 
part of the reason you came out of the bush so like I did I'd never seen you so dialed in mm. like you barely even looked at us when you were following the tracks out and you guys were on them and they crossed the road into this other property you couldn't go on to and you threw your stick down and you were like that was like two hours of super intense mm. tracking but mm. like you even said we were kind of moving a little faster than we should have been because we wanted to find them so bad and you're mm. like it was so thick I literally could have stepped on one mm -hmm. so like it can go both ways. Well, and uh, I think that, as I say, I think that's a, a great segue because I really want you to share that story. Mm -hmm. um, say, uh, and I think before we do, I think we take a little volcano break because there was a lot of intensity. Uh, <laughs> so let's just take a little hit here. Yeah. Yeah. You're hearing cracking. Even, we haven't heard the whole story from Boyd's perspective when he left us until when he got out because they were in there for like two hours and we were driving the roads hoping we'd catch the lions on the way out. So, yeah, so what happened there was firstly, you remember we drove up to the far uh, eastern corner of the Londolozi property, and there's just no roads up there. There's literally one road up and then a, a second road that cuts through. Um, so it's just this huge area with no roads, no road network, and it's thick in there. And and it's called those blocks. It, I mean, we call them a block. A block. It's just a, a, and that block is thick, and you know, there's, you know, there's just no road network. So you're just in. And in the morning, we had heard that there was tracks of a single male lion that had crossed our boundary into the property. And that was sometime around 7 or 8 a.m. So we drove up there, we got the track, and some, another vehicle with another guide and tracker had driven the whole boundary, and there was no tracks crossing out. So at that stage, we thought it's very likely that this male lion is lying somewhere in here. And I thought, you know, we hadn't seen a lion. It would be amazing if we could find him. But I just knew it was way too thick to go in there together. Um, and so life and I set off. And initially, we had the track. And then very quickly, we lost it. And, and then I got one single track. So we, and what we did is when we lost it, we just walked forward. And we were checking open ground. I, we had a sense of how the lion might have walked through the bush. We were using our sense of how lions move. But then I got one very faint track. And then we lost it again. We went for another about almost 100 yards. And then I got a second track. And I clicked my fingers and I said to life, come over here. I'm on it. And then the lion track got walked over by where an elephant had come through later in the day. And so we had a sense of where he might be moving, but the track was covered over. And then we walked down a path that this elephant had walked on. And then life picked up a very thin grass trail. Now you'll remember when we were tracking those rhino, you get a kind of like a broad trail of where the rhino has walked. When a lion walks, it's literally one piece of grass that has been pushed down. And then we got onto that trail and I, I, now I knew, okay, now we're on it. And we started to move fast on that trail and you could see very clearly where this one blade of grass had been pushed down, creating a trail through the grass. And we started to follow, we started to follow. And we found where he had lain down, then we lost it again. We got back onto it. Now, you know, the sun is starting to set. And life and I were aware that we were going into very, very thick terrain. And we we're sort of feeling into using our experience to get a sense of like, we want to move fast enough on this, but it's so thick in here. It was like jungle in there, you know, like hand in front of your face stuff. And you could feel the, the track and you could feel like you can get a lion lying in that thick grass. You can almost stand on him before you're aware of it. So we, you, we just became incredibly attuned. And the whole, you know, the three months that I'd been out in South Africa now, I hadn't really had a track like this. And I felt myself starting to go into the zone. And I felt, I felt the way that I was seeing the track, kind of like a sports person, you know, just when you, you have that day where you're, you're seeing it. And I could feel the way that lion had moved. And I started to turn up the pace. And then when I started to turn up the pace, life started to turn up the pace. And between the two of us, we were just in total flow. If the lion cut right, I was on it. If it cut left, he was on it. Um, and we moved quickly into just, and as we're walking away from you, following the line, I know we're just getting into thicker and thicker and thicker terrain. Meantime, you guys are continuing to check the boundary. Um, and then I felt myself just boom, click across entirely into a different psychological state and absolute complete presence, no past, no future. And I was just in with it. Um, and I was in that state solidly for about 40 minutes and then we found where the male lion had joined a pride and you could see where the pride had been lying and the and it was fresh 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 um 
and there's a you know thick grass and you can see where lions have been lying now what they might do is they might get up and move 30 yards and then lie down again so as we're following i'm half expecting a full pride to stand up in the long grass around us and now the sun is starting to set so we're starting to get into that twilight and as you're shifting from daytime into nighttime into twilight it's like the the stakes of that tracking encounter are changing and it, and everything is moving towards giving the lions advantage as it gets dark their mood changes they become bolder as you start to lose light you start to lose you know visual acuity you basically what's happening is as it's getting darker you're going into their world so literally night is starting to fall and we're following and i can see life's also getting in the zone and then we found where uh we saw where a vulture had come down and the lions had made a kill in a thicket the other thing is now if they've eaten they're probably going to be close because they haven't you know they've got full bellies but still the tracks are going and in fact what happened is we got onto those tracks and we followed them and we just stayed in that state. And any moment I was expecting to, in the fading light, find those lions. And then we got to get that encounter right. Then we got to work out if we can get you guys in. We got to do a lot of things well to not, to not, you know, to not be in a very dangerous situation. Um, and you know, just in that for two hours, your nervous system is in that. It's and I could feel like the other thing that happens is like literally when you're tracking, you're in a brain state. You can think of it as reading a complicated text and trying to understand it, you know? And it's, it's that type of brain state. Like I'm reading, I'm trying to understand, and I'm attuning, trying not to get eaten. Um, and eventually we followed them, we followed them, and we, I could feel we were gaining on them because the tracks were getting fresher and fresher and fresher. And then eventually they crossed the road, and they must have crossed the road just before we met up with you guys again. So it was like maybe 35 minutes ahead of us or something like that. We, we almost had it that you... We found them as you drove the vehicle onto them on that boundary road. Um, but I could feel just being in that st a level of concentration like that for two hours. One is I felt exhausted that evening, you know, just like that, that level of concentration. Um, and two, when I closed my eyes, I kept seeing images of the track. And sometimes I know when I've done that, you know, one of the things that I used to do when I used to train is I would go and track for two hours and then I would just go and lie down and sleep. And it's almost like my brain is myelinating new neurological pathways when you've been concentrating like that. And I see images of tracks and I can actually feel my brain has been in what they call deep practice. Um, you know, like a musician would get into when you're just on the edge of your capability. And, and that's where I, for two hours I was tracking well, but, but pushing and just on the edge of my own capability. And that's really what creates a, a whole brain state. And it was incredible for me. And I feel like that was, like a surfer would say, like the wave of the season, those, those two hours on that track, it was so difficult. It was so, we were so on it and we were moving so fast. It was, you know, that'll sustain me for, you know, a year and then kind of being in like that. Yeah, and I love it. It's just, you know, what Greg said is the, the th you know, the three of us got to see you as you were following the tracks and coming on to the, the road in, in just your intensity and how locked in you were. It's like, fuck that was that was cool it was, yeah and yeah. it was one of those you, you you actually just can't get it wrong you know you have to track well you have to be really alert and if you find those lines ideally what you want is you want to see them before they see you and give them space and if they see you you, you got to get that encounter right you got to stand you got to be present you got to be aware um and then trying to do all of that while also orientating yourself because you got your head down you're following in a in brush that is like you know hand in front of your face stuff so then trying to know where you are too. So you're, the thing about it is you're doing a lot of things at once and you have to do them all well. And, and I, we did them very well that day. And I, it was, as I say, I can live on that for a year now. Just well, the juice of that. Well, and you've, you've had other lion encounters before. So share like what happened when you actually were face to face with the lion that saw you. Like, what is that? How do you get that one right? I mean, the first thing is, is that you want to be, as, as I said, you want to see them before they see you. You don't want to surprise them. So you don't want lions standing up around you. So you, you and good track, you know, that's a, it's an interesting situation, but then they spook, so they're aggressive. So just being able to track and also watch up ahead of you and good trackers do that well. They'll see the animals, you know, well ahead of time. Um, when you see them very quickly, you want to, you're in an energetic dialogue. 
And so you want to show them that you're not afraid. You want to show them that you have a presence, but also you want to show them that you're not aggressive. If they see you and initially they'll be a little bit aggressive with you, uh, and then they're gauging your reaction. So it's almost like this energetic dialogue that you're in. And quickly they should work out that you're also willing to give them the space that they want. Um, and that you've surprised them. And, and in that initial moment, as they're aggressive, you, you hold your ground. And then very quickly, as they relax a little bit, and they're like, okay, they, I know where you are now. Um, then you start to give them space. And then if, if they become aggressive, for example, if they have cubs or if they are on meat and they want to come towards you, that's where you really have to stand your ground and you have to be aggressive almost back to them. That's difficult. Yeah, well, and I love <laughs> yeah, that'll, that'll, that'll get you. you. You mentioned it in, in the story there, but one of the things you said to me later that night was why you were so exhausted. You're like, I basically spent two hours trying not to get eaten. <laughs> like, yeah. fuck, dude. How do you those like them some, steaks? Those, yeah. Them are some steaks. I've, I've thought <laughs> about the pun. it in the context of like being here. Like we have... We take walks up in where my parents live in Wisconsin, and there was some bears that lived up there. And then my brother Cortez actually one morning actually saw a mountain lion, like a cougar or whatever mm -hmm. it was. And they're very rare there. But I've thought about it in the context of like, if I'm walking one morning, even here, there, there's those animals here, right? The mountain lions or whatever. I've like I take walks in the morning. It's dark. If one of them comes across my path, like I've thought about that. Like it's still scary. Yeah. Like, and like, uh, you may not get it right. Like, I'm not that practiced at it. Mm. Like you look at it and you want to show that you're not scared, but then you kind of back away. I think I know main thing. Don't run. If you run and have fun. That was the yeah, other thing Nick always said and have fun. Have fun. So like, I don't know. If, if I see a mountain <laughs> tap into that morning, shit, <laughs> taking my walk around Sweetwater. Yeah. I hope I handle it. Correctly. If, but if a, <laughs> if a lion runs at you and you run, it will chase you because it becomes instinctual. Sure. Now you're running and it, it, it's hunting instinct is right. too strong. Don't it's like a, like, a, like a leopard in a chicken coop. You know, it's just if everything that moves, it grabs. Mm -hmm. So you have to stand because that is what, what changes the dynamic. Totally. Yeah. All right, I'm good. Yeah, good. So <laughs> you're set, bro. Right. Anyone you're else set. in Sweetwater area would like a quick training? <laughs> <laughs> totally. Just get a hold of Greg. He's a... Uh, He's on the, the council for the uh, Homeowners yeah. Association of the area. He's doing a we're mountain. Doing, we're doing a gathering. We're doing uh, a mountain lion training. I've like been to Africa. <laughs> I tracked a rhino once. I'm good. <laughs> Don't run. Have fun. Single Chase. File line. Yeah. Chase, uh, walk us through the, the chapter of uh, our hippo medicine. The hippo. Yeah. Okay. So we're driving in the Land Rover. Uh, by the way, open top Land Rovers, you're looking, you mentioned like a leopard five feet away, less than that. You're, you're, you're exposed to the elements you got. It's amazing. Um, we drive around, we make, we make some turn and, uh, and we see this hippo jawbone, like this bottom hippo jawbone. I don't know what it's doing out there. We're not by the river. We're not like, how far do hippos range from water? Uh, Big they, distance. they get going. Yeah, at nighttime when they when they're grazing. Okay, interesting. Well, we find this bottom hippo hippo jawbone, and it's got some teeth in it, and the these huge flat molars. Immediately, first thing that comes out of my mind is like, oh my gosh, it would be so cool to bring one of those home for my son Aiden. The the I the, was with you, dude. I thought the same thing. Case yeah. would love that. The dean would love any of the boys would yeah. love that. So that thought kicks into play. Yeah. And we're immediately in this, in this moment, Greg, like, I'm like, Hey, can we get close to that? Can we, Greg goes like, is it okay if we get down here? And Nick says, I'll, 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 I'll allow, allow it. it. <laughs> I'll allow it. So we, we just like, well, okay. The teeth have a little bit of jiggle to them, but it's not quite coming out. Right. Um, and as Boyd said later, this, the energy sort of shifted and it got a little, what, what, how did you put it? Mine. Mine. It got, yeah, mine. it got a little miney, you know, like <laughs> taking this. Gimme, gimme. So we, we end up doing uh, what's necessary to get, to get this. It was some jaw kicking. There was some. Just, Boyd stayed on the rover. Let's yeah. be clear that Boyd wasn't down here. No, in our no. Mess. I was an observer. But yeah. You were very much but an observer. Nick and life and Boyd allowed us to treat the experience how we were going to treat it. They weren't like. Oh, you can't mm. do this or yeah, go for it. It was more like, okay, whatever. 
see what these jackals are up to. <laughs> yeah, let's see what these jackals are up to. And and what we were up to was getting this tooth, these these teeth out. And we ended up getting two teeth out. Cal had one, I had the other. Um, and and it felt like cool. We got a hippo teeth to bring home to the fam, to put on the altar, to, to, to whatever. But <laughs> very closely after, like like finally holding it and feeling the weight of it in design world, we call it heft, the heft of an object, heavy, heavy molar, heavy molar, and uh, it just starts kind of dawning on me. And I'm a little bit into a microdose. Uh, all of us are at this point, and and so like the the. Both sides of my brain, my belly, my gut, like this shame cycle starts activating and I'm not entirely sure what's going on, but I'm in multiple sides of this debate in my head. Like, this is fine. This is fine. And also like, you're, not, you're, you're, you're cursed for life. You know, what was the feeling that I was starting to have? It just, it, it just, it was best, it was best explained Boyd, you said this after, you know, we roll up, uh, we all roll up after sunset into this amazing clearing where your family had put together this outdoor meal and it gave it, we just, it was amazing. We, we were eating these good, like incredible steak sandwiches and having some wine an incredible setting. And it'll, and it was lots of fun and jokes. And it gave my mind like a, a moment to like unhinge from all of this, we're, we're having a blast. And then we get into the Land Rover to head back home and I pick up the tooth again and it just settles on me like, and I tell the guys, I'm like, guys, I'm having a lot of feelings about this hippo tooth. And Boyd says, did you take something without asking? <laughs> <laughs> Here I am. You got to understand, like, I think of myself as like a, uh, as like a, a shaman in training, right? Like I feel Part of the reason why it was probably so hard for you. It was major reason why, <laughs> you know, and I get it that you don't, you know, anybody can call themselves a shaman in training, but like, I want to live a life where I'm, uh, I've, I find this relational, this relational sort of harmony between me and the world that I'm in. And I'm looking down and holding this thing going like, Oh God, like I'm a, I'm a, I'm a greedy white man. Mm. I'm a greedy, self-centered, mine, mine, mine. And it's not just this story, right? It's all these other stories that start coming in. And Boyd's like, did you take something without asking? And then he, he pauses for a minute and he just like tunes into me. And he's like, no, now you're holding it too tight. You're spiraling into shame. And I was. So, you know, the next three days, we Cal has this idea like, hey, man, we got to find a way to to a ceremony of sorts to to give this back to the land to make amends here and i mean i think within the hour after we're like all right at some point we got to bring that back yeah it wasn't exactly clear as to how we were going to present that but it was like these have to go back and i was feeling what you were feeling on a on a uh i would say a a smaller level me too but i was sensing because i was holding the other the other tooth you were giving. Can't believe uh, you guys did that, by the way. <laughs> you were, you were giving <laughs> voice to what I was feeling. Maybe not you had quite the intensity. Inklings. Oh, for sure. Yeah. But to me, you know, like when I having watching it and sort of feeling into myself, saying like, "Hmm, how do I guide this well?" Mm. And just watching the a very pure impulse. Mm. You know, like I would like to take something to my son. Mm. It was very pure to me. And then there was a little bit of like, oh, that's not available because these teeth don't come out. Mm. And then the energy changed mm. into like, I'm going to get what I want. Yeah. And that's where the sort of jaw kicking happened, which I know is still hard for you. But, but, it was, video but what was amazing thing. about it is that like, you know, I didn't have to say too much because you guys got there. It was almost like we were getting into a state where we were mindful enough to actually be aware that we mm. maybe didn't handle that moment with the kind of mindfulness and respect that we had been in, in every other moment. Mm, mm-hmm. you know, so it was almost, it just, I, I wondered why you came to it because I was actually impressed that you did. And mm. I think it's just because we all felt that we had been in such a deep union with the natural world. And then the energy had shifted a bit and, mm. and that came to all of us. Oh yeah. And, and so I'm, I'm in the Jeep, I'm holding this thing. Like Cal's like, here, you hold mine. And <laughs> sit there and on the I put them on, the on I, like, I didn't want to bring it and, into yeah, my room. They were like room. this energetic presence. These just two molars Bro, like staring yeah, at you. I don't know, deck. They yeah. were, they were an energetic pres- like presence. Grandpa's teeth. For the next three <laughs> days. 
for the yeah. next three days. Yeah. It was like, I'm like, how, how soon? Like the next morning, it was like, let's go put these back. And it was like, actually, we just found some lion tracks. We're going to go do that instead. I'm like, I'll keep holding these. So it was a lot of my work to just hold them and to be with that. And every night bringing them back and putting them on the little handrail outside my house saying, I promise to get you back. And like, I'm not bringing get, you. Getting in. into the pool and being a hippo. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> and then like going underwater to cleanse yourself. And then, in fact, I'll try to find this. Uh, I'll try to find this if I can. One, I mean, of, the, I one of the things I, I loved about it was... Um, and was such a great lesson for me uh, watching Boyd mm. hold space for the the whole thing. And that was like one of my big takeaways is like, oh, there's so many layers to this experience. A, what you said, Chase, that mm. this is all in us. Mm. Okay, so it's all in us. What do we do when we go into that space? What do we do when someone else goes into that space? How do we allow them to not just mm. wallow in the shame and make them feel guilty and terrible about it, but how do we allow them to work with the experience and, and to really grow from it? And the way, I mean, it was just masterful, the way Boyd just held us through that. It was really, mm. it was really special. It's like, oh, this is why we're doing it. This is learning for us on many, many levels. Mm. You have to make mistakes sometimes to learn, right? It's like, I Truly. think of it in terms of like, you, we watch our kids in what, helicopter parenting or whatever, like you don't want them to make a mistake. Yes. But the biggest lesson comes in making the mistake and how you react to it, how we can help the kids understand it's okay to make a mistake. Right. And like doing that whole process, I, that's what I took a lot from. And it, your intentions, like Boyd said, were so good. And then there was this whole lesson around it that like it was it was such a big it was, it was cool it was a big journey so I mean like literally like putting the teeth out I got to get in the pool that there, in Londolos you just have a little personal pool behind your room like incredible Four Seasons vibes I get down in the pool like at night I'm just feeling so much and I'm my mind is just filled with these visions of of hippos and what it's like to be in the water when there are animals like that present you know and and just what is the life of a hippo and so it, it just became it was a big part of this journey for me it was the main part of of the the journey for me because it was it was so much of that shadow right brought so much of that shadow up and now i'm swimming in it and it's like you just stomach it you know this is i've learned this in the medicine journeys you you're stomaching it this is good nothing is fucked here dude you know <laughs> so i ended up writing this thing i'll read it really uh, it's like a little paragraph it was called Hippo Tooth. My mind was alight with reasons why, but I play it back in my head, kicking teeth out of a skull. It started when I was holding the molar in the truck. A lovely night, full moon and lion calls in the distance, red wine, conversations and laughs amongst men in the bush. But when I picked up the molar on the way back to the lodge, reality folded in on me. The weight, what have I done? The belly sputters like a tangled jellyfish. Boyd saying, did you take something without asking? No, you're holding it too tight. Don't spiral into shame. This place is forgiving. What have I done? The molars, mine and Cal's now sit under the full moon. I'm too afraid to bring mine inside. Shame swirls like a tornado around me. I can find the center of the cyclone. The boys... For an evening bag at my room, I apologize. Boyd talking about how there was a moment, maybe it was the kicking, where it all got a little iffy. <laughs> I'll allow it, said Nick before we started. I said the same thing to Bronwyn about Melissa and Taro, half joking. This is very big medicine. The heft of the molar, the effort of removal, the dirt on the roots of the tooth, the stories of two hippo bites at Londa Lozi, one, a chef fishing yellow fat in the grass. One, the arm wiped clean, but the essential artery miraculously still intact. What have I done? I bathe in the pool outside my room, dunking underwater, blowing out my lungs so I can sink cloudy water, hippo teeth. Everyone else is gone now, and I'm alone with the hippo teeth. I was really feeling it. That is beautiful. Uh, that, let's go through now. Yeah. How, it kind of, How does the story How end? Does the story end? Okay. Because yeah. Where it goes because as interesting as what we've this. Okay. On. Two things. First is we're tracking lions the whole time. We got lion tracks day 
two, we're on the hunt, we're looking. Day three, you're in the block on one of the best tracks of the year. You come out of the bush. It's like we just missed them by minutes. You're like, ah. The next day, we wake up, we're back on the lion track, and we just come around this corner and like, oh, there's the hippo jaw. Meanwhile, we we, we have a, a short window. We're flying out that we're flying day. Flying out that day. Yeah, Boyd had morning. some some work to do, so he wasn't with us. And we come around this corner. We're waiting for life is in one of these blocks tracking look on the track. So our tracker is in there and Nick's in the Jeep with us. And we're, we're sort of going around the outside where the road is waiting for, to get word from life. And, uh, and we come around and here's the hippo jaw and we're like, okay, now's the time I've been carrying these things for days, you know, <laughs> heavy. And we, we have a little ceremony and it actually feels really good. It feels really good. We, we, we just spend some moments and we return the teeth and I can feel myself. I can like, I've been in dialogue with these things for a while and it feels good. It feels right. It's like, ah, so we get back in the Jeep and within moments, life's radioing. We go to life. He's not far away. He's pointing behind us, like almost to where we came from. We get, he gets in the Jeep and we come out and there's this mama lion, this, this huge, and when you see a lion in person, you're struck by the size of the face, just the size of the paw, Head huge, massive. Just ma- like the weight of it, right? They could basically like, like this, like Nick said, they probably knew we were there the whole time we were at doing the hip hop. Like yeah. watching, close. they were, yeah. they were holding yeah. space they, for our ceremony. They, they, they were yeah. aware, I mean, just, we were that close. Just think about a lion though. You take away the teeth and the claws you're still dealing with a 400 pound athlete who can do the hundred meters in four seconds, Mm, mm. you know? So you're, you're dealing with a, just to give it some perspective. Yes. Yeah. So we see the mom, the mom and then, and then in the bushes behind is, is this male, big mane. He's been around. He's got some scars. This guy's big. And three day journey to find lions. Yes. Three day journey to find lions. So then it, then it, we get we get this beautiful moment with the lions we've been looking for and we got this time and and you know in safari you the result the reward you get at the end of the tracking at the end of this thing is what you turn off the engine and you're in this stillness with a wild animal who's never read your blogs before <laughs> As far as you know, yeah. a lot of times they're not doing anything. They're just sitting there. Fucking like he was sitting. like literally sitting yeah. back sunning his balls. Yeah. Oh, those balls were so sunny. Right? We got some like good footage of him. Just like chilling. We got some good footage. And of by him. the way, we are going to be releasing uh, yeah. a video that Chase shot some incredible footage and has some incredible commentary. So mm. we will be releasing this in tandem for. Yeah. For, yeah. Where, people, where, are people gonna be, where are people going to be able to find that? Just my name, Chase Reeves on YouTube. That's my channel. I can't change the name of it. I've tried. But the the what comes out from Nick, our our ranger in the Land Rover with us, is that female, I'm not sure about the male, he mentioned specifically that female lion w- was a part of that hippo's death, or at least ate. And he didn't know if she was part of the, the kill, but she ate from that hippo. So it's like this whole time I'm holding these teeth going, we need to do this. You guys, we need to get these teeth back and we're hunting lions and Boyd's throwing a stick. Cause we just meet, we just lost the lions. And, and, and the moment we return this tooth back, the, the land provides, so to speak. And it's with it, it, the, to find those connections where this lady had, had been a part of that hippo kill and had eaten that hippo. It was, it was, you find those kinds of this, it's like a small world out there. Nick. And these rangers know the stories. Yeah, but Nick like said it in passing as we're like driving away. Yeah. He's like, hey, by the way. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that uh, lion actually killed the hippo, but 100% I watched her eat it. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. It's like, dude, that was information you mm. were going to just hold on to. Huh? Yeah, yeah, thanks. But it does. The whole thing, though, speaks to, I mean, if people are listening, thinking like, what's up with these guys and the, the hippo tooth? Well, <laughs> I mean, the thing is, is that when you're out there, you are attuning. And when you're attuning, you're increasing your level of sensitivity. And that sensitivity is to the entire environment and how you show up in it. And... So that's, that's kind of the essence of that teaching for me, you know, the, and actually you had the sensitivity 
to to realize like maybe how I conducted myself, even though it was the skull of an animal, the way we had been, we'd been so respectful through every movement. Mm. And we just we just missed one beat, yeah. you know, and but we corrected it. But I also think like, oh, you know, masculine sensitivity is it's hard to, you know, the journey that we're seeing now is so many men trying to shed the patterning of how we were forced to harden ourselves and condition ourselves to not feel. Um, but out there amongst the trackers, you know, sensitivity was at the foundation of mm. everything we did mm -hmm. because uh, you had to be sensitive to the changes in the environment. You had to be sensitive to the, the story of the track. You had to be sensitive to the calls. And so actually a kind of a sensitivity to your environment was deeply embedded into being good in the bush, being keeping alive in the bush and, you, you know, doing so much work now in environments, not like that to try and get people to feel again and try and get men to feel, but out there, it taught you yeah. to be sensitive. Yeah. And I think that's what I watched happen. Like mm. it was teaching us to be more sensitive and more attuned to life, to mm. mindfulness, to how we bring ourselves to things. So it was really cool in the end. Really just the, the, I just want I find myself so longing for nature for I've always I've been saying like been in this medicine journey path for like four or five years. And the whole time it's like this phrase in my head's going again and again. Nature is the medicine. Mm -hmm. Nature is the medicine. Nature is the medicine. Right. And here's here's this nature like I've never experienced it. And I'm in it. And in this like, you know, this like I want I want I need comes out. And it was, it was so, I mean, I want to say it's, it was so perfect. It was, it was such real, like, oh, you felt it. Like mm -hmm. I just, there was no escaping this. Right. And we had one other hippo experience, which is we're, we're down by this river tracking lines and we end up around this, this like hill bend down into the river. We spooked some big animal and it was a hippo. And that was the first time I saw you go get in the Land Rover mm -hmm. because it came up on the other side and you didn't know if it was going to feel like it could have a way over there. And because the hippo is actually really dangerous. Well, in that situation, I could see that uh, the way that the topography was, the hippo was, was uncomfortable with how close we were. The water was a little too shallow for him. So his inclination was to get out of the water, but there was a bank that he couldn't, that he was stuck against. Yeah. So you know, again, like reading the entire situation, he feels under pressure and he feels like he's got nowhere to go. Mm. So that could create a dangerous situation. Mm. And that's why we wanted to give him space really quickly. Yeah. But, you know, just to sort of land the plane on that, uh, the, in a society where the individual self is disconnected from the whole, so we're operating as I, I need to achieve this, mm. but we're not really in tune with our environment. We've, we've manufactured our environments. When you're disconnected from that, the search for meaning is reduced to a constant state of comparison. Mm. And that comparative dynamic is actually structured into the society yeah. and it's structured into our psyche at a certain point. So the only way I can work out how I'm doing is by comparing myself. Where am I in my career comparatively? Yeah. Uh, where am I financially comparatively? How am I doing comparatively? And that is what most of us are living with. Whereas when you go into the natural world and you spend time with someone like Renius, or you're just out there, what you're operating in is in a relational environment. So it's how do I react in relation? It's different. It's not comparison, it's relation. Oh, that's happening, so I must change myself in this way. Or that's happening, so I must learn in this way. Or, I must react in this way. And so it's just a different structure of psyche and relationally is how we lived for thousands and thousands of years. And it's still and, how we're living. And, yeah. Just just not not quite as well, maybe. Totally. And to try and work out how do I get out of the comparison back into relation. And then say, you know, as a in the masculine or in the feminine, like, how do I build a relational environment that actually supports my essence? And it and for me, that's the core of the work that I'm interested in right now is like, how do I create a life in which I get to express my essence? Um, and, a, and a field of relation around me that allows me to do that. And that feels, that feels like uh, I I, I my think, lesson of the day. Uh, yeah. And, 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 <laughs> I'll, I'll be teaching. <laughs> we'll, we'll, no, that's just what I'm thinking about. Yeah. You know, in, in, I'm glad you brought that up because I feel like um, 
you're you've kind of been the the straw that stirs the drink here in Austin since you you spent a lot of time here in the past year and I feel myself and others we have been able to be um in relation to one another and and, and we've joked about what the fall was like felt like we were, you know we were in college and it was like the first semester and everything was fun yeah. and we were all just we were riffing with one another, connecting, and we were all able to stand up in our own genius without trying to be something that we weren't. And I felt there was such a beauty to that. And I feel like doing the work, you know, of going inward, catching ourselves in our reactive patterns, but doing it in a way that is not like overly earnest. It's not like now we're doing the work. We're just living and live time feeding back to each other, adjusting each other, sometimes taking a little hard feedback offering each other ways to look at things. And I, I feel like, um, you know, we're, we're building something which feels really good. Mm. It would have been pretty simple. I mean, and I'm not saying like we're some, like, not trying to pat ourselves on the back. Just say it, pat, pat away. Pat well, away, like, Come on, in terms Greg. of you Pitter saying patter. like the masculine and sensitivity, mm -hmm. like college, like it would have been really easy. Like if someone is like, oh, I feel stupid about taking those teeth. Not being such a wuss, uh, dude. You took him, bring him home, and like yeah, those things are dope. We could have pig piled yeah. on him <laughs> and like totally killed the way he was feeling, and like instead, yeah, processing. We yeah. all kind of like supported how he was feeling, yeah. left it open, and like it wasn't something we consciously thought about. We just did it, and we were just like there to support how you were feeling. Yeah, it felt good from that perspective to like be there for, for you mm. and for all of us to like see the gravity of the situation and just kind of like take it in stride and figure it out together. And you, again, you, you, you're holding it for all of us mm. in our own, our own version to that experience. Yeah. Like, again, you were the one who was feeling it maybe most viscerally and you were again, giving words to what you were, mm. you know, kind of experiencing. But for me, it was a, like a deep connection to what you were saying. Mm. And I just, I wasn't, I didn't have the, hey, I had fucking Omicron. I didn't have uh, <laughs> capacity for words. And I, then and I, and I think about it too, is, you know, instead of stepping in and saying, hey, guys, don't do that, allowing it to unfold, knowing that at some point I'm going to bring it up and ask questions, you know, hey, can we just revisit that? You know, that's, that for me is coming from Renias and Alex, who were my mentors, who never shamed me. And I'd done a lot of things wrong and made the wrong choices in certain instances. You know, that way of doing things comes from them, which comes from Renius, really, which comes from his way um, of mentorship, which is just to be with you, ask questions, help you learn, never tell you, never shame you, just always inquiring with you. Um, and so I also feel the sense of like mentorship can travel, you know, and if we get, if we can do the work of getting good at that, and we've all got a lot of work to do. And you, if you're well mentored, you become someone who wants to mentor. And I think that's a really beautiful, natural, mm. it's natural. It's not like you have to think like, now I'm going to be a mentor. It's, it's just, yeah. if you were someone who was given something by someone, presence, growth, learning, you just become someone who wants to give that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it just speak though, if you take anything from the story or for any of these stories, it's just, there's something so, there's something really sacred about wilderness. Mm-hmm. If I think I treat it as, as, you know, as one of our most important resources on the planet, mm -hmm. because where else can you go and get this kind of mirror fate, like to look at yourself through, like you just don't, you just don't. And, and it's, it's not something, I mean, we can be a part of creating regenerative landscapes and helping the land. Apparently there's like research now that the Amazon, a lot of it was cr like was farmed into this massive wilderness that it's become. It's like, I don't know. I just heard that. That's really blowing my mind. But this idea of, of we have a role of stewarding the planet and the most, the most majestic, most interesting, most magical, most medicinal, most healing spaces to me are natural. And that wilderness, it speaks to the wild in me. It speaks to the lion in me. It speaks to the, to the, to the like, juvenile jag leopard like hitting on mom trying to get her to to play which there's so much good footage of like it just speaks to you said this in the in the jeep like 
we're watching this juvenile male with his mother, Leopard, and he's sort of like playing with her, like biting her ear and trying to get her to go in and, and cut to Boyd in the background whispering about the cathedral of the wild. But he's like, it's the energy of mother. It's the energy of son. And without any words, it kind of speaks to your own humanity. And it's true. It and, really is. And for me too, to one is to watch those archetypal energies of which we're a part of. And then the other two is like, like when I'm tracking that lion at sunset in a wild place, I am expressing myself fully in, in, in that's my art form and I'm in my art form and I'm expressing myself in my art form. It's not something you could ever say, this is who I am, or mm. it's a live expression. And in being in the wilderness, I can't say how, but I feel like I know myself. I feel, oh, I know a part of myself that I can't just get to mm. lying on the couch somewhere. You know, yeah. it's like, I know my alertness. I know an intensity in me. I know um, an edge in me. I, so it's giving me a way of knowing myself. That, That's that the is, gift. It, it's um, intangible almost. It's yeah. a feeling, right? In, ineffable. You can't You, you can't, can't say. It. And it yeah. does it say to it. you. Yeah. It, doesn't to, it does it to you. If you have any, any amount of just sensitivity and sense of it, and again, when you're walking down on foot in a landscape where it's like, it kind of turns on automatically, but it gives it to you. You don't have to like read a book about it. Yeah. You don't have, it, it happens to you. And you couldn't set out to find it. So even like the notion of, I want to find my purpose or I want to find, it's like you're going to arrive in some constructed frame and then, and now I'm in my purpose, yeah. but it never is. It's constantly, it's an evolutionary, alive, intangible, energetic quality that we touch from time mm. to time. Mm. Um, I love it. And, and, and just to wrap a little bit of this in a bow, people have asked me because they've know they know, you know, that I traveled to Londolozi back in 2019. What's it like? You know, people are always wanting to go on trips. I'm like, you can't, you, you can't experience this anywhere else. It's just that deep presence, the opportunity to be in the wilderness in a way that I can't give words to. You have to go experience it. And it's held by the, it's held by the staff in a really important way. It's held by the architecture of Londolozi itself in an important way. So, so you find yourself coming off the airport and you're already in safari on your way to Londo. You get there, you have some green juice or some water or whatever. You get into your room, like the rooms themselves, like everything about it. And then the staff, the, the mindset of the staff and the way, the way, so you're kind of like, you're kind of guided um, subconsciously. Like everything's sort of supporting you towards this, these experiences with wilderness that, it, that ends up feeling like a sacred encounter. But, but the thing that I also flash on is like, okay, 1926, gin tennis party. <laughs> then um, Dave Varty standing up saying, we're going to keep it. Then um, John Varty saying, that's my future. That leopard is my future. Um, then Tinley arriving. Then you, you flash forward through hundreds of people's encounters there. And then, then like through a guest who comes to Londolozi, I end up in a, on a podcast. You're driving somewhere or Buddy sends you that podcast. Twice, because I didn't listen to it the first yeah. time. And and then like you hear that podcast and you decide to come. Because you come, we connect. Uh, because we connect, I end up in Austin. Because I come to Austin, I get together with these guys. Because of that, we end up back in South Africa together. And I guess what I'm saying is like, when you, you, when you track, there is some incredible intelligence running through all of this and it's moving us all around. And I can't say how we became friends or, but something is moving us forward. And I don't know what I'm trying to say, but I'm trying to say that you followed a knowing, you heard a podcast and you booked a flight and you flew halfway across the world to go on a retreat with an, you know, a largely unknown dude who runs tracking retreats and watch what that is given. So what I guess what I'm trying to say is when we follow the non-rational part of us that knows, it moves us forward in ways we couldn't possibly conceive of. And that, it, it, there seems to be an, a deeper intelligence in that. When you look back at it over time, Jobs' is, Steve Jobs' is whole thing of you can't connect the dots looking forward. So when you look back and you, ca and you lived out of that knowing, you were living aligned with some other bigger intelligence that keeps creating. Which, is, which is... I'm into that. Love it. Which is like, when I think of what I really want in, in life, 
there's some there's something about that connection to the divine and that connection to the divine is sort of tracked in these like it never comes out and says here's what i'm doing bud you know yeah. it's tracked in these in betweens and in these and it's like it has to build faith because like you're the thing being shaped by it and we can choose to go like i'm the master of my domain and i'm responsible for all of this stuff that hippo tooth's all me i'm going to take it home or i'm going to put it back but it's all my fault or whatever right we like i'm the reason why and there's so much of that like i you get up and you work out like you're responsible for the way you look right you're responsible for the health of your body but this thing you're talking about boy this this sort of mover that's moving all of us to be in relationship with that mm -hmm. is is in some ways like the best it can be it's like when you can derive some meaning from that when you're sensitive to it and noticing it i mean whether that's just like hey it's 11 11 or whatever you know what yeah. I mean? or whatever yeah. there's like little ways there's big ways and the most interesting ones are when it, it's sort of it's just like whoa looking back and tracking all those moments that you're talking about and who knows where it goes like you kind of hold it all open-handed i'm just happy you went to lambda Lab this time that's right you're yeah. welcome yeah go and Lindsay, Lindsay, who's here in the room with us, Lindsay, she got, if you haven't listened to my wife, Peyton, Lindsay, and Maureen on the podcast, you want to hear about their experience. It was tremendous. And Lindsay was amazing on there, as were the other women, but I know Lindsay was a little nervous about it, but she mm. killed. So good job, Linz. Yeah, Linz. I did want to say, just circle back for a second. Um, Boy, you're talking about mentorship and you're given something and, and, and Greg, you hit on it too. And I think it's so important because I think a lot of people listening are parents mm. and how can we just parent differently? It's what I've tried to do, kind of go outside, you know, go, go off script and really tune into what my kids need when they quote unquote fuck up. Like, how do we work through this and not shame them and not punish them? have it be a learning experience for them and for me. And, and, and I, so I love that you brought that up. I think we have plenty of opportunities to mentor on a daily basis. Yeah. And it wasn't something that I thought about when we're in South Africa, like consciously like, Oh, I'm going to go there and I'm going to have a better relationship with my kids. <laughs> it just so happens that like, you know, I have an 11 year old boy who's got a lot going on and I don't feel like I'm always parenting him that great. You know, like I struggle with that. Like, I don't want to get mad at him. I don't want to get in fights with my 11 year old, but we butt heads a lot. And like, I'm constantly trying to figure out ways to be a better dad, mm -hmm. but still be a dad, right? Without right. just being like, dude, do whatever you want, because then you'll like me. So it's, it's hard. And like, I'm hoping that as I learn from Case, that I'll be better with Ben and Shay and Dean. Mm -hmm. And it helps to have, you guys it helps to have friends who are consciously trying to maybe kind of parent a little differently than the ways we thought we should um but it's hard man i, I struggle with it all the time so it is hard i think those are people going to remember like it's not easy if it's easy no. you're probably not quite doing it right you're maybe yeah. just trying to be the best friend dad or you're just it's a super prick a to super your kids fine line like you want to be your friend but also have to be the dad and like and like even if you're guru mentor extraordinaire like you're gonna lose your temper sometimes i'm working a lot on not beating myself up when i do because uh, i have four boys and i'm gonna lose my temper sometimes yeah. and shan and i are working on trying to play off of each other better and and support each other so that we can be good parents for the kids while also being their friends so Shannon, if you didn't figure it out, is Greg's wife. Greg's wearing a hat today. House of Shan. Go to houseofshan.com. Get some dope gear. Mm. They support uh, each month. They support a different um, yep. charity or effort. Yep. This month was Truth Be Told in Austin. Uh, I believe February is Heart Month. So there'll be a, I don't know what we picked yet for uh, February. but We'll be supporting a, another charity in February. Mm, love it uh, i would love to um there's like kind of a almost a part two to the hippo story it happened here yesterday 
um, at our house. We had uh, we have a kind of a big kind of glassed in staircase and a hawk, red tail hawk, mm-hmm. right? Red tail hawk flew into it and unfortunately died. And so Peyton and my son Bowen kind of brought the the bird, you know, kind of in the backyard, came to me. Uh, Boyd happened to be here and said, hey, look, this hawk flew in the window, died. I think we need to bury it. Like, like kind of let's sort out what, what to do. And so being the wise man that I am, I brought Boyd with me because I knew he'd know what the right thing to do was. But, you know, we, we go to the, to the bird and it was like, again, it was the first time I can't believe I'm 50 years old. It's the first time I've held the dead animal. Mm. And I think it's just maybe ingrained in me from a very young age that, animals that are dead carry diseases and mm-hmm. usually it's a mouse or something that I maybe haven't held in as high regard as this beautiful hawk, but that's something that I'm working on. But, you know, just to, to hold the bird and feel it and to, to just see the, the, the design, it, it was, I mean, that was just part of this mm-hmm. journey. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know what we, well, I, I'd love for you to kind of get, give your take on what that meant for you well the thing about it for me is that you know when one of us learns and i think that this was deepest for you with the hippo it teaches all of us and so i was coming to that hawk with that experience you know inside of us and so i felt the learning continues to travel and so i just felt like we were able to like that's a majestic animal that had left that body and we were able to, you know, in the backyard in Austin, tap into that same respect for the natural world. And we kind of knew how to lay him to rest in a really deep way. Um, and Peyton and I had both had a really strong sense of, you know, where we could dig his, his place to lay and how to, how to put him in there. And Bo came and we were able to say some prayers with some tobacco and, you know, uh, ask for some feathers and feel that it was okay to take his energy and hold his his totem totem energy with us, but it a lot of the, that gravitas came because we were we had been attuned together mm. to that state. So it's mm. really it was kind of like, you know, in the middle of a a Sunday in Austin, it was still the medicine was still traveling. So, mm. Yeah, that's, yeah, right on Championship yeah. Sunday for the NFL. <laughs> you just never know. Yeah. We were tracking football, and then we had this encounter with this beautiful hawk, and and yeah. Jake was there to you know, kind of also experience the the beautiful hawk energy. So that was super cool. And doing it right where you right where you're from. You know, doing it right here where where it's all, you know, land rovers of a different kind and uh right angles and houses and getting your whatever. I don't know why I can't getting your gas filled, whatever. Just modern life. Modern, modern, modern checking emails, all of this stuff. Here's this there's this, and I mean, the hawk is such a majestic, I mean, it's not like your everyday crow or, which is also a majestic animal, but. Do the right thing. Do the right respect, thing. Respect that animal. And it is, it's respect is the, is kind of the lowest common denominator here. And you respect a lion when you come up on it in the bush. You're like, oh, uh, like you have nothing but like respect. In fact, maybe too much respect and you start running, <laughs> right? Yeah. But that finding that here in our in our everyday life is one of the good things about being in Austin or just about anywhere. Is there's so much wilderness right here. Well, and, and and I was sharing the story with Greg beforehand, and and we were just sharing our own experiences of not touching dead animals, and it's like it's a mouse or whatever. And then we're like, well, that mouse is still God's creation. It still deserves the respect mm-hmm. of of the hawk. Mm -hmm. And so how can I reorient when I'm faced with that situation? Right. And I kind of, I get, I get a lot of shit around the house because I don't kill, um, (laughs) spiders uh, and shit, cockroaches and spiders. And yeah, it's hard though. Like I said, what about when you catch a mouse or something? Like we had a mouse in our pantry. Hmm. I'd set a trap and I, caught the mouse and then I kind of threw it away, but maybe on the other side, instead of throwing it away, maybe instead of just chucking in the garbage, maybe you go 
bury it somewhere or like baby steps with, like you said, animals that you don't hold in such high regard. It's uh, a little, feels a little different, but in reality, maybe it shouldn't. I don't know. Well, I mean, I think what we're talking about is sacredness. Yeah. You know, just bringing the sacred to real life. Mm. And actually the sacred is not so much, you know, how we adorn ourselves. There's a lot of, you know, feathers and blankets and, mm. and the show of sacredness, but really the, the sacredness is that we got to be mindful about the parting of that creature and we got to do something together with intention and that that mm. that flows into it you know i love it yeah, yeah. and i love it so we'll go one more, one last thing before mm. we get a wrap here and i would be remiss if i didn't bring up the healing house mm -hmm. and so chase um i would love for you to kind of share the experience that we all had or okay. start to share that experience okay so so on londa Lozi's main lodge area there's there's this there's this beautiful separate house thing basically that has all glass facing this massive hillside with a river in between. You're just constantly looking at, uh, at this gorgeous landscape with animals all over the place. And this house is called the healing house. There's several little rooms in there. There's these lovely women who are like, hello, how are you? We've been waiting for you all day. We've prepared these slippers, which I have on right now. And, like some towels and there's a sauna it's and, spa. and a cold plunge. Right? It's a healing house, Greg. Just... <laughs> Come on, Greg. Come on, Greg. <laughs> it's a spa. And the and just to give the context. And so Bronwyn, Boyd's sister, we come we come in, we're all sitting on these little meditation cushions, and she just immediately drops us into this space and we're like, and she just takes us really deep with just her perspective on what we're here to accomplish. I mean, it breaks old Greggy down to tears over here when he's sharing what he's yeah, beautiful. what he's bringing, you know. And, and she opens the space. We 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 come into it. She this always gets me this sense of this thing like where it's like we're going to we're going to support and love on the masculine. Mm. You carry so much. We want you to drop it all right now. And let us serve you. And I'm just like, <laughs> like it just brings up yeah. stuff. So what they did is they had three different sections for three different men. And we went through these this cycle, basically. One person was getting a massage. One person was getting sound healing with Boyd's aunt. And one person was doing the sauna cold plunge. And with so the, with the skin. Well, yeah, with uh, the skin um, what do you exfoliating yeah. scrub, right? So they break us out into our separate locations. I started with the with the sound. Where did you start? I started with the the skin scrub and the sauna. Sauna cold plunge. And you were massage. And, yeah. The sound healing. I mean, I've done a lot of sound healing stuff, but your aunt was oh, yeah. amazing. Powerful healer. Conch shell. Like yeah. she starts it off with this conch and it's just like blowing it right into my head and it like threw my when body. She did that to me. I literally was feeling the vibrations everywhere. Yeah. It felt so good. She started off, and I'd never seen this done before. If you're a sound healer out here, here's the move, okay? Here's <laughs> the fucking move. You get one of your bowls, you put some water in it, and she's just like, you know, you're 70% water. The earth is 70% water. Here's what happens with water when there's some vi sound vibration going. She starts doing the crystal bowl thing, and the water's just like, and it's splashing you. It's going nuts. And then... Fat, you know, then an hour of her doing more stuff it was like that gong. gets you vibrating. There's, I mean, I was, I fell asleep. Even her treasure there. chest is deep. She's yeah. like, was the gong a little alarming? I go, I don't really remember. <laughs> I don't think I even heard it. I was so like deep in like sleep, meditation, whatever you want to call it. Like she got me into a state of like complete mm. rest. Mm. And then the massage was one of the best massage. You said, talk about the massage. I've had a lot of massages. And if you've given me a massage out there, I don't, I mean, no disrespect, but this massage, the best one I've ever had in my mm. entire life. Yeah. 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 It was, it was a really beautiful, like three and a half hours of just getting loved on and regenerating your own cells and taking care of yourself, getting really dropped down and relaxed and letting it go. And it's cool for us, you know, you think we started as lion hunters 
And now for my sister and I, we really want the space to be a place that catalyzes healing and transformation in people. Mm. And for me, being able to share the whole experience is, you know, being able to share it, but then also to, to think about how we're affecting your nervous system, your circadian rhythm, how we're cascading certain neurochemistry through your system, oxytocin, noradrenaline, serotonin, dopamine, how we're creating connection, how we're approaching the natural world. And all of that put together starts to put you into a different state of being. Yeah. And in a different state of being, you can look at the past and what has shaped you, uh, but you can also imagine the future from a different place inside of yourself. Mm. And, and consistently, um, the natural world does, and Lon Lozi does that. Lon Lozi is an incredibly healing, transformative place. And it's, it's by design and it's by magic. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So, um, uh, you know, it's a bit like you wake up in the morning, you're tracking a line that afternoon, you're getting a massage. You know, all the beats are there to create a state in which transformation can occur. Mm. And the food is incredible. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. They didn't, you, know, story. You, you all don't miss a thing there. Yeah. So like any closing remarks from anybody, anything we missed. Thank you again, Boyd, for hosting us. Mm. Thank was, you guys for coming out. It's honestly, been such a, that was a trip I've wanted to take. I mean, people yeah. say bucket list, whatever you want to call it. Like, that's been a trip I've wanted to take forever. To be there with you, your sister, meet your dad, your mom, like everyone, like so special. Thanks. Yeah, I loved having you guys out there. Yeah, get out to Safari as soon as you can. <laughs> Honestly, it is it is such a a like you remember it, you get you get immersed in a world that all of your DNA was shaped by. All of it, billions of years we spent in this kind of a landscape doing these kinds of things. And I have to take a flight to go halfway across the world to get into that. And it happens to you. And it happens to you. It's not like you have to think your way into it. You might need to, it takes, it might take some hours or days for the emails to go away. You know, it might take some time to just fully disembark maybe the feel free certainly helped a lot <laughs> yeah. for me with that but then you're out there and your nervous system this old 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 brain this old system this ancient part of you this ancestral sort of you know machinery is like i remember this and I didn't, it's not like things came to mind to like oh i know how to do it. like i'm still an idiot in the, in this space but there's something so so much like coming home in it that that I I was expecting that on one hand because I've read you know books in this direction but but there was it was so accessible it was and it was immersive I loved it loved it well I just loved hosting you guys and it was so good uh, you guys have taken such good care of me in Austin and so I felt just really good to share that place with you good okay. times thank you and we didn't even get to talk about our three days in Cape Town so oh. <sighs> Cape Town to be, to be continued to be continued. Um, mentioned it. I don't know if we actually mentioned it, but Boyd's book, The Lion Tracker's Guide to Life. If you listen to my podcast, you've obviously heard me talk about it before. We'll have links to that in the show notes. Mm. He also has another book called Cathedral of the Wild, where he talks a lot more about um, Londolozzi. So some of the history he gave today, there's goes a little deeper into that and some of his own kind of traumatic experiences growing up. Mm. Um, which is a lot of medicine in there. Uh, where can everybody find each of y'all? If you mentioned Shannon's website, that's the best place to kind of see what, what I'm doing outside of this besides my nine to Anything, five any, any snippet to share a little bit? Of, I mean, I talked a little bit about House of Shan, but can you? Uh, I mean, Shannon and I, but Shannon created this brand, House of Shan, that's uh, the logo's the Imperfect Heart, and uh, $5 from every purchase always supports different women's and children's charities the imperfect heart is exactly what it sounds like like trying to embrace your imperfect and it stands for lifting others up and never quitting your daydream and a lot of like just positive energy around that so that's uh, it takes up a lot of our time and it's been a really fun launching it there so fun to be here in austin and trying to figure it out here after being mm. in chicago yeah that's an amazing brand and the, the quality of the uh, of the Sweatshirts, sweatpants, t-shirts, hats is is amazing. So well House done. of Shan .com. Yes, sir. House of Shan. I'm Chase Wardman Reeves. Uh YouTube channel is just Chase Reeves. See me in the Instagrams and the YouTubes or whatever. 
but I've got, uh, there's a video already out of, of this sort of like a vlog style with some tips and tricks. And then there's another one that's going to be probably launching at the same time as this, which is more of just day one, day two, day three, all of the excursions that we went on. Perfect. Boydvati.com. That's the best. Yes. So it's all on there. Books, mm. online courses, thoughts. Perfect. All right. And the 40 day podcast is an interesting thing that people can know about if they don't like Boyd yeah. goes and we go into this, this tree house that Boyd lived in for 40 nights, 40 days and 40 nights. It's the track your life podcast. Um, yeah. Check out the 40 days and 40 nights. Yeah. It's rad. Perfect. Thanks for listening. Y'all. Much Cheers, love. everyone. Thanks.